More than 25 years ago, I was fortunate to spend a day at an estate called Borderland near northeastern Massachusetts. It was once the residence of artist and women's suffrage advocate Blanche Ames Ames and her husband, Harvard botanist Oakes Ames. They married in 1900, and a decade later, they moved into this extravagant, self-designed castle in the area south of Boston. Blanche and Oakes refer to their home as Borderland because it borders nearby towns. It is now officially known as Borderland State Park because it is the centerpiece for an 1,800-acre preserve and outdoor recreation site. The massive stone mansion, which was designed and its construction overseen by Blanche Ames, consists of 20 rooms on three floors, including a prominent library space. Blanche was an artist, and beginning around 1912, Borderland was often where she and her brother, Adelbert Ames II, known as Dell Ames, worked together on artistic and scientific research. She had attended Smith College, graduating in 1899, while Dell was a student at Harvard, where he earned a law degree in 1906. He worked as a lawyer for five or six years, but woefully disillusioned, he turned instead to the study of art. Among the things that I recall from my visit is that there was a particular room in which were hung reproductions of the works of German artist Hans Holbein the Younger, a room that was referred to as the Holbein Room. In light of that artist's achievements, it comes as no surprise that Blanche and Dell admired his work. But there is an additional reason to dwell on their interest in Holbein. While he is deservedly praised for his compelling portraits, including those of Henry VIII, Thomas More, Erasmus, and others, there is another somewhat mysterious painting by him that stands apart from all the rest. It is a double portrait known as The Ambassadors. Painted in 1533, it has been in the collection of the National Gallery in London since 1890 and has been extensively written about since the end of the 19th century. Although there is no solid proof, Blanche and Dell were undoubtedly well acquainted with this painting, given their heightened interests in Holbein and in optics as related to art. It helps to look at Holbein's ambassadors and to ask what relevance it has to the study of optics and vision. Even a cursory glance suggests that there's something peculiar about it, that it features something that does not occur often in detailed portraits such as this. There is a strange, nonsensical shape in the center of the bottom half of the painting that seems to float above the floor. Much has been written about this. It seems it is an artist's trick, a bit of skullduggery, if you will, in which the image of a human skull, a reminder of mortality, has been so dramatically stretched that it is only identifiable when viewed from the extreme right side of the painting by placing one's cheek against the wall. It is an example of what artists, architects, and stage designers call forced perspective or accelerated perspective, but historically it is also called anamorphosis or anamorphic perspective. This would have been of interest to the two Ames siblings, and no doubt to Dell especially, 
because in the years that followed their collaboration at Borderland, Dell would go on to develop, while on the faculty at Dartmouth College, a series of about 25 laboratory setups, which he called demonstrations. They are now formally known as the Ames Demonstrations in Perception. But the aspect that makes them relevant here is that many of them, perhaps the better word is most, make repeated, frequent use of anamorphosis, which is to say that they appear distorted from a customary point of view, but yet they appear to be normal from a monocular peephole, an oblique single point of view. Of these demonstrations, perhaps the best known three include the distortive room, the chair demonstration, and the rotating trapezoid window. When the Ames demonstrations were first popularized in the 1930s and 40s, they were praised as highly unusual, which they were to a great extent in the context of psychology then, but they were not unprecedented. Rather, the optical principles on which they rely had been explored by artists for centuries, the ambassadors being only one example. Indeed, anamorphic paintings go as far back as the Renaissance in European art history, when they were a spin-off from linear perspective. They may even date earlier in China, where erotic art was hidden in stretched images that could only be deciphered by viewing their reflection in a mirrored cylinder. Perhaps the earliest reference to anamorphosis is in the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, dated 1485. In his Codex Atlanticus, he called it accidental perspective, as distinct from natural perspective, and included in the margins two examples of his own anamorphic experiments, drawings of a human eye and the face of an infant. They are distorted when viewed straight on, but look all but normal when viewed from the side. I myself discovered this inadvertently as a student in elementary school. I have always loved to draw, and one day, while seated at my desk, I became tired and I rested my head on the desktop while I also continued to draw on the paper next to me. Moments later, when I sat up and looked at the drawing I'd made, I was startled to see how elongated it was, although it looked perfectly normal when I again placed my head on the desktop. You can easily see what I'm talking about if you look at this vintage cartoon of a man fishing from a bridge. The fisherman looks normal enough, but a closer look at the surface of the water reveals then an anamorphic portrait of the composer Ludwig van Beethoven has been hidden in the pond. It is radically stretched, but it soon becomes reasonably readable when viewed obliquely from the side by putting one's head on the desktop. Below that, is a vintage typographic anamorphosis in which greatly stretched letters that spell out A happy are slanted diagonally toward the right while New Year is leaning toward the left. They can be read from the edge of the page. Beginning in the late 15th century, as part of a burgeoning interest in perspective the interest in anamorphosis surged. It was increasingly common up to and including the end of the 19th century, and interest has lately been growing again, with the rising popularity of illusionistic sidewalk art, and because distortions are easily made with computers. However, it has long been regarded as a cheap trick not worthy of being included 
in the upper echelon of art. As one critic said dismissively in 1906 of Holbein's The Ambassadors, it is marred by anamorphosis, which is a shallow artistic scientific curiosity unworthy of a work of such noble seriousness. Cheap trick or not, it is not so easy to dismiss Parma Giannino's self-portrait in a convex mirror from 1524. That said, there are few famous serious works that make use of anamorphosis. Those that are best known include a highly detailed woodcut by Erhard Schein from about 1533. At first glance, it looks like a landscape, but a closer look reveals that it also includes anamorphic portrait heads of four prominent people of the time. Shane also made less ambitious anamorphoses that were either scatological or borderline erotic works. But a far more respectable image is the well-known puzzling portrait of Edward VI, made by William Scrotts in 1546. These are, of course, flat surface distortions, like the earlier examples of Beethoven hidden in a pond. They are essentially trapezoids, in the sense that they have the overall shape of a rectangle turned in space, so that one edge looks smaller, the other enlarged. Having said that, those who are familiar with the Ames demonstrations will most likely realize that Dell Ames made frequent use of the same traditional method. This is evidenced by the shape of his rotating trapezoid window, the name of which reveals the trick. That window has the overall shape of a trapezoid, but it is painted in such a way as to take on the appearance of a rectangular window turned in space. As a result, when mounted on an upright shaft and rotated by use of a motor, it appears not to rotate, but to swing back and forth in space. This strange effect becomes pronounced when additional components, a playing card, a cube, a rod, are attached to it, in which case they appear to rotate, but at times they also appear to bend, cut through the window, or to float in space, while the window continues to sway back and forth. The same strategy of positioning a trapezoid so as to make it look rectangular is just as readily observed in the back wall of Ames' best-known demonstration called the Ames Distorted Room, as shown here. But Ames built more than one version of the distorted room, and the forced perspective in this one is vertical. Nevertheless, the back wall is still a trapezoid. The logic of perspective is that as distance increases, size appears to decrease, and forced perspective toys with that. There are size and distance trade-offs in other Ames demonstrations. In the architect's room, for example, and with impressive complexity in the chair demonstration. With regard to the chair demonstration, it may also help to note the resemblance between the cabinet in which Ames housed his chair configurations and the cabinets used for centuries for the peep shows or rary shows of street peddlers. These were commonplace in Europe, although the particular one shown here is an example from China. Glancing back in history at other flat surface anamorphoses, there are plenty of trapezoids that appear to be rectangular, not from a centered frontal view, but from an oblique position. 
This technique was especially useful in the concealment of erotic imagery, in distributing satirical invective, or as advertising novelties. Today, one that we see almost daily is the elongated bicycle symbol on street pavements, which is made to be seen from the viewpoint of the driver of a car. Flat, trapezoidal-shaped distortions are only part of the story. As mentioned earlier, there were other images designed to be deciphered by observing their reflections in a cylindrical mirror. Sometimes the mirrors were cone-like forms, at times convex, sometimes concave, or other basic, simple shapes. In addition, there are abundant examples of architectural anamorphosis, including large-scale murals, illusionistic ceiling vaults, and typographic lettering that can only be read from an oblique, preordained view. And of course, there are other variations too, such as curious double images called tabula scalata, or ladder pictures, as seen in this portrait of Mary, Queen of Scots, dated 1580, in which her face becomes a skull as the viewer shifts position, or another in which Christ is transformed into Mary. Of the dimensional anamorphoses, among the most intriguing are so-called perspective cabinets or perspective boxes, sometimes known as peep shows. Certain 17th century Dutch artists were the undisputed masters, notably Samuel van Hoogstraten, who made this interior view of a Dutch house. At one time, there were many of these boxes, but only six survive today. They are housed in such museums as the National Gallery in London, which also has Holbein's ambassadors, the breadiest museum in The Hague, the Detroit Institute of the Arts, and in other collections. According to art historian Celeste Brussati, an expert on Van Hoogstraten, so few have survived because they were devalued as children's amusements and mere curiosities designed to please a naive public. They were seen as being like funhouse mirrors, trivial and beside the point. Samuel van Hoogstraten's peep show is mounted on a pedestal, as seen here in two different views, Originally, the interior of the room was veiled with a translucent screen, but today it can be seen through glass. There is an exactly placed peephole on each side of the box through which viewers look inside. In the process, one sees the interior of a Dutch house with a patterned tile floor, two chairs, a dog, and doors that lead to adjoining rooms. Everything seems as it should be, providing one only looks into the room through one of the two designated peepholes. And yet, as can easily be seen by looking instead at the front of the box, there is no room, no chairs, no dog. It is all a clever concoction, which depends on the very same hijinks that Ames would later make use of in the architect's room. Here is an unassembled view of the paintings on the interior surfaces of the three walls, floor, and ceiling of Van Hoogstraten's perspective cabinet. The two white circles on the sides provide the size and locations of the peepholes. From these images, the room could easily be reconstructed. Van Hoogstraten's peep show was given to the National Gallery in 1924, while Holbein's Ambassadors was acquired nearly 35 years earlier in 1890. Given the intensity of Ames' research, 
and the resemblances between his demonstrations and historic anamorphoses. Surely he had to have known about these. And yet, as others have mentioned, it is puzzling that he apparently never credited these with having inspired or influenced him, even though, as noted at the start, a Holbein room was set aside at Blanche's home at Borderland. Did Ames visit the National Gallery in London after the ambassadors had been added to its collection? When I asked if he traveled to Europe, his son thought not. But there are in government records travel documents that show his return from British ports in 1903, in early 1914, on the SS Vaterland from Southampton, and again in 1950. The return in 1914 may be of particular interest because it coincides with the period when he and Blanche were researching art and optics. Even if Ames had not actually viewed Holbein's ambassadors at the National Gallery, he would have had access to scholarly discussions of it in research journals. In addition, he would have been closely acquainted with the most important pioneering book about optical science at the time. A groundbreaking multi-volume source book by Hermann van Helmholtz titled Treatise on Physiological Optics. It was published in German between 1856 and 1867, with an English translation available in 1924. As British psychologist R. L. Gregory has noted, as have others, in that book, Helmholtz very clearly described a monocular distorted room anticipating the Ames demonstrations. Helmholtz wrote, Looking at a normal room with one eye shut, we think we see it just as distinctly and definitely as with both eyes. And yet we should get exactly the same view in case every point in the room were shifted arbitrarily to a different distance from the eye, provided they all remained on the same line of sight. The difference between Helmholtz's proposal and the Ames distorted room is that Helmholtz did not build a room. On the other hand, von Hoogstraten did. <laughs>